The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... The secret key to unlocking the mysteries of Daniel and Revelation in the prophetic books of Scripture are the stories in the Bible. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Millennium of Prophecy video series. The theme of our study tonight is the millennial man. A very bright king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And in that dream, he saw this majestic, colossal image. And that image outlined the history of the world from Nebuchadnezzar's day to the end of the world. And that's why it's important for us to study this prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar was a general who had managed to conquer the then civilized world. Babylon at its zenith had two of the seven wonders of the world within its walls. The walls of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and so also you've heard about the hanging gardens of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar built for his wife, Semiramis, where he had beautiful trees imported from all over the world. He went to sleep and he had this dream. Evidently, he had a good heart. And God spoke to him with this vivid, three-dimensional vision that outlined the history of the world. And in Nebuchadnezzar's dream is a picture of what we can expect in the future. Now, before we go to the study, we're going to get a little overview of what that vision was. You can find it in your Bible in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31, and take note of the animation that you're going to see on the screen. It says, Thou, O king, saw, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of gold, and fine gold. Its breast and arms were silver. Its belly and its thighs were of brass. Its legs of iron. His feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image on the feet that were of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away so that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now there you've got a visual picture. You've got it on your, in your Bibles of what this dream, what this vision is about. This millennial man made of all these different minerals outlines the history of the world from the time of Nebuchadnezzar to the end. Why did God give the Babylonian king this dream? Now, the answer is in the Bible, Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. But there's a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and he's making known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So this dream reveals the secret about the last days or the latter days. It's telling us the future. Now, I want to give you the background a little bit. After Nebuchadnezzar woke up with this dream, he knew this was not a dream from eating too much camel steak. This dream was something that had a tremendous impact on his mind. He knew there was a meaning to it. He called together all of his wise men and his counselors, the astrologers and the prophets in his kingdom, the psychics, and he said, tell me, I've had a dream, and I need to know what it means. And they said, okay, tell us the dream, and we'll manufacture, I mean, we'll tell you the interpretation. Well, these uh, so-called wise men were on the king's payroll, and they had a habit of conjuring up fanciful prophecies that were usually very flattering for the king to help them get promotions and pay raises. And the king said, you know, I've had this dream and it's beginning already to fail. And if you have a dream and it shocks you and just a few hours later you, it's becoming unclear, the details. And he said, you claim to be prophets. I want to know what the meaning of this dream is. If you're a real prophet, you tell me what the dream is and then I'll know you can tell me the interpretation. Well, they began to squirm. And they said, well, that's a little unreasonable. I mean, yes, we've got special gifts, but that's asking too much. And the king was aggravated because he was suspicious that these prophets were counterfeits. When the king's counselors failed to reveal and interpret the dream, 
What was Nebuchadnezzar's command? Answer, the king commanded to destroy all of the wise men in Babylon. Now, we need to pause at this point and back up and give you a little bit of history. You see, a few years earlier, Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jerusalem. The temple had been burnt, and just a little before he did that, he carried away a number of captives from Jerusalem back to Babylon, where they settled for about 70 years. Among those captives were four young men who were of royal descent. Their names were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They were trained in the Babylonian palace. They were allowed to eat from the royal cafeteria, and they were being groomed to be ambassadors and counselors and ultimately wise men for Nebuchadnezzar. They had been chosen for their brightness. Well, when the king gave the decree that all of the wise men should be destroyed because uh, Daniel and his three friends were so young, they weren't invited at that point. When Daniel learned about the death decree, what did he ask of the king and what did he tell his friends? The answer, it tells us, Daniel went in and he desired of the king that he would give him time. Why? That he could show the king the interpretation. He said, you haven't invited us. We knew nothing about this. Give us a little time. And I think Daniel may have even put a limit on it. What did Daniel do after that? You can bet that uh, he and his friends had a very intense prayer meeting. It says here, then Daniel went to his house and he made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret. This was something that only God could reveal to them. When the Lord revealed the dream to Daniel, to whom did he give praise and credit? Now, this is very important. Answer, Daniel said, I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers. There is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. God revealed the secret. What two objects did Daniel say that the king saw in his dream? There were two specific things that were different. What were they? First of all, thou, O king, sawest and behold a, what? A great image. This colossal image that was gold and silver and bronze and iron and iron and miry clay was an idol. And you know what the Bible says about idols? It represented the pagan religions of the world. And it represented all the false and the counterfeit methods of truth in the world. Answer to the second part, thou, thou sawest till a, a stone was cut without hands. Now that stone that is cut without hands, there's something supernatural about the stone. We'll find out more about that later. What does the head of gold represent? Let's go right now into the interpretation of what these different materials are in the dream. Daniel told the king, thou art this head of gold. Daniel said that King Nebuchadnezzar, and in particular the kingdom of Babylon, that was the head of gold. Babylon was one of the most glorious kingdoms of antiquity. One historian tells us it was 15 miles on each side making it 60 miles in circumference. The walls of the city were over 65 feet wide at the bottom and 55 feet wide at the top. And Herodotus says that you could ride four chariots abreast around the city on top of the walls. The river Euphrates ran underneath the city. The Euphrates River irrigated the city. It ran under the walls through the city and out the other side, and they used that water, of course, to irrigate the hanging gardens. Not only that, it was a beautiful city. They had glazed blue and gold and purple tiles that mounted the walls and the palaces. And so here, Babylon was symbolized as this head of gold. Would the kingdom of Babylon last forever? Well, how long did the gold last? It is followed now by another material. It says, after thee shall another kingdom arise inferior to thee, just as silver is inferior to gold. Babylon lasted from about 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. There's some details in history so we can know how it fell. As a matter of fact, the book of Daniel tells the history. Daniel was there when Babylon fell. Chapter 5 of Daniel tells about this wild party Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar, had. Nabadonis, Belshazzar's father, Nebuchadnezzar's son, was off fighting battles somewhere else. And his son was all of a sudden in charge of the city kind of pronounced himself 
king in place of his father. While his father was away, they had a wild party. In spite of the fact that the Medo-Persian army had now marched against Babylon, young Belshazzar said, we're not afraid. They'll never get through the walls. One historian tells us they had 20 years worth of grain stored away in their silos. They had water running under the walls. He thought, we've got food, we've got water, we can withstand a siege of 20 years. So they had a wild party. And he became very pompous as he drank. And he said, you know, my grandfather conquered the, uh, the people of Judea, and he carried away all the sacred vessels from their god and from their temple. Let's bring those sacred vessels, their cups and, and bowls out. Let's pour our wine into it, and let's toast our gods, because our gods are bigger than the god Jehovah of Israel. And he began to mock the god of heaven and drink to the gods of gold and silver and stone and wood. And as he was mocking God, suddenly a hand appeared and began to write in burning letters on the wall over by a lamp. And you know what, you know what it said? It said, the party's over. That's not exactly what it says, but in essence, that's what it said. That handwriting was written a cryptic message, meaning, meaning, tinkle you farson. And again, now a young Belshazzar, he calls for all of the, the wise men and the psychics to come, and he dials the hotline. He says, what does this mean? These flaming letters are up there on the wall, and his knees were, were shaking together, the Bible tells us. And they said, we don't know what it means. And he proclaimed that he would give great rewards to anybody who could tell him what it means. He'd make him third ruler in the kingdom. Finally, Daniel is brought in. Now Daniel's an old man. Seventy years have gone by. And Daniel says, I'll tell you what the writing is, but you can keep your rewards because I know what it says, and you will not be in a position to reward anybody. And Daniel gave the translation for these words that were on the wall. You can find it in Daniel 5, verse 25 through 28. Meaning is the, the first statement. Then, and the meaning of that is, then meaning, tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And then the last part is Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That very night, while this event is taking place in the banquet hall, Cyrus, a brilliant Persian general, diverted the Euphrates River where it runs underneath the walls into a dry, hollow lake bed. And remember we told you the river ran under the walls. Cyrus had a whole army of engineers digging this channel. Then they broke the dam. The water that normally runs under the city walls was diverted off into this dry basin, and his army marched underneath the walls of Babylon. That's why when it says in Revelation, the Euphrates River dries up, it has significance. God had foretold 150 years before Cyrus was born in the book of Isaiah that this was going to happen, and he mentions Cyrus by his very name. Here it is in Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointest to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so the gates will not be shut. You remember I told you that his army then marched in the muddy riverbed under the walls. There was an inner gate, and the guards in the city were drunk, and they'd left the gates unlocked, never dreaming that they'd march up the riverbed. Just as God had predicted, the doors had been left open, and Babylon fell that night, and Belshazzar and all of his cabinet was slain, with the exception of one old wise man named Daniel. God's word never fails. Something else Isaiah prophesied about Babylon, not only would it fall, and the Persian kingdom would then take its place, but it would never be rebuilt again. It would never be inhabited again. Here you find it again in the book of Isaiah. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation. Nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. But wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls, ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will scamper or play there. Saddam Hussein wanted to disprove the Jewish prophecies. He had extensive plans to rebuild ancient Babylon. But history intervened with something called Desert Storm, the Persian Gulf War. It drained his treasury. And here you actually have some photographs of his attempt to rebuild the wall. He did succeed in restoring a section of the wall for tourists to look at. 
and one of the gates was restored, but he did not thwart the prophecy of God. And here you've got a picture now of the ruins of Babylon. It is still in ruins. God's word does not fall on the ground. What do you say? You can trust it. Man cannot overturn the word of God. It's going to be dependable. The next kingdom that came on the scene that followed Babylon, as you heard, was Medo-Persia. It lasted a little longer than the Babylonian kingdom, 539 to 331 B.C. Now, the Persian people were a very aggressive and a warlike people, and they were greater in numbers, and their armies were larger. Silver was their medium of exchange, and they did extensive building, but they never reached the same glory as ancient Babylon. Here are some of the ruins of Persepolis, and they had a lot of very beautiful, ornate buildings. This was a palace that Alexander the Great burnt to the ground because his soldiers got drunk one night, and it was considered to be one of the wonders of the world. Silver was their currency. Isn't that interesting? Matter of fact, there at Persepolis, they unearthed a silver goose. Silver was their medium of exchange, but as I've already hinted, that kingdom would not last forever. It was then replaced by another. What metal would represent the kingdom that followed Medo-Persia? Answer, another third kingdom of brass shall bear rule over all the earth. This bronze kingdom, of course, represented Alexander the Great, and who was he the king of? So it was Macedonia, but we commonly call it the king of Greece. One historian wrote, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people then being whither his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding over his birth and actions. This is a historian saying, some divine hand seemed to be presiding over his birth and his actions. Greece went from 331 B.C. to about 168 B.C. What metal represents the fourth kingdom? Daniel chapter 2, verse 40. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Now, what do you think that fourth kingdom was? That was as strong as iron. The kingdom of Rome. Daniel 2.40 tells us, Inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Iron was considered so much more desirable, and Rome was able to conquer the world by virtue of their iron weapons. Edward Gibbon, the uh, famous historian, said, The images of gold and silver or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings, they were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Even the historians refer to Rome as the Iron Empire that spread its roads and its tentacles into northern Africa, Spain, England, and they continue to expand. Notice each kingdom is lasting longer than the one before, but did not have the same luster and glory as the one before. Rome went from 168 B.C., where they defeated Alexander, Alexander the Great at the Battle of Padena, or the Greeks, to the mid-4th century A.D. The reason we can't give you a precise date there is because Rome did not fall in a day. It wasn't built in a day, and it didn't fall in a day. Rome sort of disintegrated slowly from within. What would happen after the fall of the Roman Empire? Answer, the kingdom shall be divided as the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay. It's a divided kingdom. It's united, but it's not welded together again. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, what came out of the fall of the Roman Empire? Well, gradually, because of their decadence, they began to lose control. Pretty soon, the empire was invaded on all its different fronts. It began to divide from within through all these coups and this activity. The barbarians and the Huns began to attack from the north, and the, uh, the German tribes, they were attacked by sea. And little by little, Rome's power was eroded until in the place of the Roman Empire, covering basically the same geography, there was now what we think of as the modern nations of Europe. How many toes did this uh, beast have, or this image have? This colossal image had ten toes, and it was divided into ten kingdoms. Here are the ancient names of those ten divisions. Would these ten kingdoms ever succeed in uniting? No, they would try, but they wouldn't succeed. It says they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, they tried to do it through intermarriage, but they will not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. 
several attempts were made to reunite and to forge together that ancient luster that Rome enjoyed. Rome sort of was the pinnacle of world empires when it comes to its expanse. Charlemagne tried, and he was able to gain a great deal of power and prestige, but he could not regain the formal glory. Louis XIV also tried. Napoleon probably came as close as anybody. A little general, a little corporal. The deliverance, one historian writes, the deliverance of Europe from the dominion of Napoleon was effected neither by Russia, nor by Germany, nor by England, but by the hand of God. He came so close, and then there at Waterloo, he gave some orders that were misunderstood, and cannons were misplaced, and everything fell apart, and they got stuck in the mud, and you could see the hand of God say, no, they will not cleave one to another. Adolf Hitler had this vision of grandeur that he and Mussolini would be able to join together their powers again and establish this thousand-year Reich, trying to last even longer than the Roman power. God said they will not cleave one to another. Now, you might be wondering, doesn't the book of Revelation say that there's going to be a one-world government? No. Revelation chapter 13 says that this beast power compels the whole world to worship. That's not government, that's religion. There is going to be an attempt for one world religion before the end comes, but there never is going to be a one world government. Who will set up the final kingdom? And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. There is a kingdom coming that will last forever. Now I want you to notice something, friends. We are living at the very end of time. We're living down in what you would call the toes. We're in the toenails of this great image in the scope of history. Everything has happened right on target as God foretold it would. I want you to notice, what are the feet made out of? It says the feet are made out of iron mixed with miry clay. Have you ever thought about what our world is made out of today? Our world is made out of the number one building material is concrete. You ever watch people work with concrete? First, they take the iron and they put it in the forms. Then they pour in the mush, the concrete. What do you think that would have looked like to an ancient prophet who didn't have a word for concrete? It would have looked very much like miry, which is mushy clay. Iron mixed with mushy clay. New York City is called the city of iron and concrete. We are living in the civilization of concrete, which is iron mixed with miry clay. We are living now in the last days. What does the stone do to the other world kingdoms? Answer, the stone was cut without hands. Incidentally, pardon me, I want to stop. There's only one other time in the Bible when a stone was cut without human hands. The Bible tells us that God hewed two tables of stones from a mountain. Okay, so this is supernatural, this is good. The idol was bad. The stone wins in the end. The rock is Jesus. He's called the rock of ages. The stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. And then it goes on to tell us, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. And as you study prophecies, you'll understand a mountain is a kingdom. It grows into a great mountain and fills the whole earth. The Jews are praying for the coming kingdom. Protestants and Catholics pray, thy kingdom come. The earthly kingdoms rise and fall, and there's a lot of instability in the world governments. But there is another kingdom coming that's going to last a long time. This colossal image outlines the history of the worlds, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron. Let's review quickly. The gold is what kingdom? Babylon. The silver, what kingdom? Medo-Persia. The bronze is what kingdom? Greece. Iron is the kingdom of? the iron monarchy of Rome, then the iron and clay are the ten divisions of what we would think of modern Europe now, and they reach from about 476 till when? Till God sets up his kingdom. After hearing Daniel's clear interpretation of the dream, what did Nebuchadnezzar say about the Lord? The king answered Daniel and said, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets. He said, the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. You know, what Nebuchadnezzar said is still true today. Nothing has failed. The words of God have not fallen void to the ground. The next thing that is scheduled is that stone is going to come. 
Some people think the Lord is going to come and leave and life's going to go on uh, like normal. And we're going to find out, I do believe the, the Lord is coming, but I think that after he comes, everybody's going to know. And it is not going to be life according to normal. And there is not going to be a second chance. Now is our time to get ready. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this week's special offer. Are you aware that nowhere in the Bible are we told to read the Bible? But it does say in the Bible, search the Bible. Do you think it's God's will that there's this much confusion and diversity in the name of the Bible and God? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is an absolute truth, and you know what's more? If you seek for it, you will find it. Is it possible to see into the future? What's in store for planet Earth? Crime, war, and natural disasters appear to intensify every day. Do they herald an approaching cataclysmic event? Discover secrets in the Bible that will change your life forever. Call now and order your copy of the most amazing Bible prophecies today. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at AmazingFacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. AmazingFacts.org. Friends, it's amazing but true. The Bible actually refers to the United States in prophecy, and it reveals important details about the future of America. You owe it to yourself to understand these last day events and to be ready for what lies ahead. We'd like to help you understand the subject by sharing a free gift with you today. It's this study guide entitled, The USA in Bible Prophecy. It'll help you dig even deeper into this exciting topic. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 181. If you prefer, you can simply write us at Amazing Facts, offer number 181, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have today for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember the encouraging promise of Jesus. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your opportunity to take advantage of this week's special offer. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. You may also visit our website at amazingfacts.org. Thank you for watching Amazing Facts Presents.